Hey guys, uh, another honey badger for you today. Last Friday I had uh, Professor Amy Chua on. Uh, the, the show is not up yet. This is followed by another honey badger in a slightly different domain, but with equal testicular fortitude. Today we've got Christopher Rufo, who is a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute and a contributing editor at City Journal and someone who's become the nemesis of all folks who love critical race theory. How are you doing, Christopher? Very well. Thanks for the good intro. <laughs> well, it's it's really nice to finally meet you. Uh, I think we've followed one another uh, for a while on Twitter. Uh, maybe we can start with, I mean, the conversation, of course, today will, will center quite a bit on critical race theory, but, but critical race theory is a manifestation of a more general set of problems, which we can get into. But maybe we could start with how did you become the central repository of all things CRT? Yeah, it's like a lot of things in life, a, a bit by accident. Uh, it, it kind of happened uh, inadvertently, really. I was reporting on a number of issues uh, in West Coast cities, so homelessness, addiction, crime, urban disorder. Uh, I got an anonymous tip from someone who said, hey, you really need to do a records request on the city of Seattle Office of Civil Rights. They're putting employees through internalized white supremacy training where they have to get up and apologize you know, for their inborn traits and it's really a mess you should check it out so uh that was the story that started it all and then you know as a my background as a documentary filmmaker and as a filmmaker and as a journalist as a writer sometimes you find yourself just catching something and then just chasing it and riding the wave and um, it's led to tons of stories research projects a lot of media and uh uh, really just that one story led me to start peeling back the onion to try to understand this ideology, but more importantly, trying to understand how does it actually manifest in institutions? What does it look like not in the pages of the Harvard Law Review or some you know, peer-reviewed uh, you know, semi-scientific journal somewhere, but actually what does it look like in, in how it affects real people in schools and governments, et cetera? Had you been at all aware of CRT prior to receiving that original whistleblower? Yeah, I, I had as kind of just a, a consumer of news, as a, as a, an interested person in politics. It's something that I'd been somewhat familiar with, and I think the the problem, as you alluded to, is a lot of these ideas they're they're nebulous by design. They they have a lot of intersecting parts. They're all coming from complex lineages. That's something that I've been really trying to to pick apart. And uh, there's all these semantic games too. I'm sure you've you know come across all the time. It's like it's like a it's like whack-a-mole where every time you kind of put something down, they say, well, we rebranded as some equally ridiculous and misleading euphemism uh, that, you know, you can't possibly, you know, it's going to say, well, it's not critical race theory. It's going to be called, you know, beautiful newborn puppies. Uh, it's something that you can't really attack. <laughs> right, you know, right. uh, that's how they work. Yeah. So for those folks who may not know what CRT is, give us the foundational tenets of what CRT is, and then hopefully by understanding that definition, we can understand why it's quite an illib liberal framework. Yeah, and I'll try to do a good job at representing it, you know, accurately. You know, CRT is based on uh, critical theory, the idea from, you know, kind of that took height in the 1960s that uh, you have to look underneath the surfaces of things in order to understand mechanisms of power. And the critical race theorists have applied that through what they call the lens of race. So you really need to look at um, in American context, American laws, institutions, cultural practices, and economic patterns through the lens of race, and you have to uncover uh, what they think is the pervasive and unchanging essence of racial oppression. And, you know, they argue explicitly that things like uh, equal protection under the law, private property, unfettered freedom of speech, uh, and even enlightenment rationalism are all camouflage for a white supremacist, patriarchal, capitalistic uh, system of domination. Yeah, well, in, uh, in the parasitic mind, in my most recent book, I list a bunch of concepts that are now considered uh, manifestations of white supremacy. And as I think you know, Christopher, because as you said, you've been following me for a while on uh, my social media, oftentimes my satire proves prophetic that so that when you read the list, you really can't tell that whether it's true or it's got sad satire. Right? I mean, the, the scientific method is white supremacy. Mathematics is white supremacy. Showing up on time to meetings is white supremacy. I mean, everything is white supremacy, correct? Yeah, and, and I, I, 
you know, I've talked to a lot of folks and, and, and I've talked with a lot of people who are racial minorities and they're like, this is insane. I, I could never go to my meetings in an office and say, well, actually showing up on time to the meeting bill, that's just your white supremacy. Uh, and, and in fact, it's like the most demeaning and, 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 and it's like inadvertently racist, right? It's like minorities aren't capable of rationality or individualism or showing up on time. Like, this is so bizarre and so strange. It's like you enter this alternative universe where people take these ideas so seriously. Right. Um, and yet any normal person, your kind of your neighbor down the street would look at it and say, this is garbage. What is this? This doesn't have any any pertinence to anyone's real life. So how do you, so, you know, as, as a psychologist, one of the things that I try to do is if I'm, if I'm studying, say, a particular consumer behavior pattern, one of the things that we might do is use what's called discriminant analysis so that we could find out what are the particular variables that discriminate between you being a purchaser of my product or not being a purchaser or having voted for a particular candidate or not. Because by understanding the predictors of you having done A or B, I can hopefully use that in some actionable way. So if I were to ask the exact same question in terms of who are the people who are likely to be parasitized by CRT or to be the promulgators of CRT versus those who are not. Because as you said, there are minorities that you speak to that go, what is this garbage? And yet there are, of course, minorities who, who, who swear by uh, CRT, like our good mutual friend, Kendi. Uh, and so, uh, and yes, I'm saying, I'm saying this uh, satirically. So do you have any thoughts about how we might use, whether it be demographic variables, racial variables, uh, personality variables, to try to understand who is prone to be parasitized versus not? Yeah, I, I mean, definitely. That, well, first of all, I imagine what you probably do in your in your academic research and, and business social psychology research is el eliminate as large of uh, groups of people as you can first to just narrow it down. Um, you know, CRT is an elite ideology that is promoted almost exclusively within elite institutions. So you can take your lower class and your middle class people of all different racial backgrounds immediately out of your sample. Just get rid of it. Um, and then I think you look at where it pops up and what kind of people are, are, are clinging on to it. It's not a racial demographic. Uh, I, I think that there's a lot of representation across different racial groups. Um, and it's really people who are within institutions that are not productively oriented. So there are no checks on these institutions, like in the marketplace or uh, um, or, 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 you know, un, in kind of the commerce realm, these are institutions that are protected. So you have things like universities, things like uh, even within companies like HR departments, um, uh, things that are more bureaucratic in nature, schools, school districts. Um, so I think you can look at those institutions and then pick out very clearly which ones are the most likely home to this stuff. And psychologically, I don't know. It's really hard. It's hard to 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 diagnose it, but. I've noticed a couple patterns. You have people that um, are swept up in the emotional appeals of things like critical race theory. They really want to truly feel like they're fighting this, this great battle of good and evil. And by simply, you know, taking their white fragility checklist test that they're somehow solving racism uh, without actually having to deal with, you know, racism or poverty or, 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 or other tangible problems in real life. This right. is like a, a cloistered ideology that they feel like if you and I talk amongst ourselves, us, you know, uh, uh, in the kind of thinking class, if we talk about amongst ourselves and achieve pure consciousness of, of, of racial, you know, white supremacy in our society, just by that very brain to brain connection, we will have solved the problem. Um, right. And, and, and that's, I mean, that's, that's the kind of the mechanism in your book. It's like, how do these ideas travel? Where do they travel to? Who do they travel with? Uh, right. Well, I mean, if I were to think off the top of my head of a few psychometric properties or, you know, personality traits that might predict some, you know, who's likely to be parasitized or promulgate this nonsense. I mean, certainly scoring high on the ethos of victimology would be one, right? Uh, you know, I, as I often remind people when it comes to the oppression Olympics or victimology poker, I, I hold the top hand, yet I haven't chosen to live my life this way. I, I, my, my background shapes part of who I am and I will remind people of where I come from. 
but I don't use that to score victimology points unless I'm literally arguing with someone who only abides by that calculus, in which case I use my victimology to def to defeat them in their game. But my, my background, my victimology background doesn't define me. On the contrary, I have transcended that, right? Whether it be through my own personhood or through the, the, the upbringing that I was provided by from my family and my culture and so on, uh, we, we're, we're supposed to overcome uh, that background. So I suspect that, you know, the orgiastic pleasure of being viewed as a victim is one. The other one I would say is, uh, you know, as you said, being a noble savior, right? So there's, the, so the, the, it's usually the liberal white folks at the elite institutions who are riding on their, you know, uh, horse to save those poor people of color, correct? Yeah, that's right. And I, I'd be curious what you think about the psychology of that, because you've had this, I don't know, you look at like in the British Empire, I mean, there was the the old, you know, civilizing influence, that was the, the trope that people had, the kind of uh, white man's burden. Is this a similar psychology that is now just overlaid with like liberal and progressive identity categories? Or is it something different? What do you think? Well, well, thanks for asking. I mean, I think it's it's a bunch of things. It definitely is a, it, it does reek of implicit racism, as I think you alluded to in one of your questions, because you need me to protect you without my overseeing your protection, then you couldn't have made it on your own. What, what could be more racist than that? And I'll give you a great uh, story that I recount in, in my book about this exact point. So I was contacted by a representative of... Uh, my business school, there's kind of a woman's, uh, biz, you know, John Molson School of Business women's group or whatever. And OK, that's great. And they, they reached out to me saying, hey, you know, we're uh, we're fans of yours. We'd love for you to come at our next event to speak about, you know, how you've built your career on being an ally to women. And so my response in a typical inimitable God sad way, I said, well, I haven't been an ally to women. I have been an ally to everyone who is worthy of my attention and mentorship. That includes women, men, purple people, tall people, fat people, people from other planets. I don't discriminate in terms of who, to whom I serve as an ally. That's what being a professor is. But hey, I'd be happy to come and talk to you about uh, the evolutionary reasons of sex differences. Well, thank you, Dr. Saad, but no, right? So my point is that isn't it infantilizing to say that I've built my career protecting women as if women needed my protection in order to operate in the business school world, correct? Yeah, and I think like there's just also just the hilarious, I mean, this is all, it's all BS, right? It's like, you know, these, these very grand symbols and terminologies and labels that we bestow upon each other that we're these great uh, allies and saviors. And it, it doesn't, it's like, it doesn't track with reality. It doesn't track. It's like a, it's a language game more than it is something very tangible. In, in, in academia, as I explained in the parasitic mind, I mean, this is where all of these parasitic ideas come from. Now, what people oftentimes used to tell me, and maybe now they're finally realizing that uh, it was it was idiotic for them to to say what I'm about to explain. They would say, well, but isn't this just some esoteric thing that's happening in some humanities department uh, at the university professor why do you why are you so hyperbolic why are you exaggerating this problem and i would say well listen in the same way and I've, I've used exactly those those analogies that's why the book is called the parasitic mind in the same way that an actual virus can break out of a lab these dreadful ideas will not be confined to the rarefied world of academia. Eventually, they break free and then they do make it to our HR departments and they do make it to politics and they do make it in all of the CRT places that you are now seeing them happening. How do we get people to understand that this is not just some, you know, battle between a few, uh, you know, uh, highfalutin academics, but it's really going to affect people's lives? Yeah, I've thought a lot about that question and really tried to gear my work towards solving that problem practically and motivating people to to actually not only understand it, but to take action. And I think the the thing that I've done that is most successful that I've that I've seen is is taking the debate out of the realm of the abstract and making it an actual tangible narrative fact. Um, because, you know, you and I could debate about critical race theory, could debate about its merits, could go back to the literature, could 
we could talk about it all day in a way that just muddies the water. There's no clarity to it. But if I tell you, you know, hey, in Cupertino, California, they're forcing eight-year-olds in public school to deconstruct their racial and sexual identities and then rank themselves into oppressor and oppressed classes. Um, that's going to get your attention. Right. And, and then that's going to get parents saying, wait a minute, this is now starting to impact me. And I think you're exactly right. I, you know, the, the, the old conservative argument was, look at all these crazy kids on campus. They're studying these BS majors. They're going to be unemployed. Uh, ha, ha, ha. That was like the argument. And it's, it was so short-sighted. It's like, well, no, those kids that were studying the BS college majors are now in BS bureaucratic departments of public education systems teaching BS ideas to your kids. Well, and this is what it looks like. You know, I was going to say uh, some of those unemployed kids whose highest uh, level were a substitute drama teacher even become prime ministers of Canada. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Right. So uh, so Justin Trudeau, I, I had I had gone on uh, Joe Rogan's show one of the times I had gone on where when he first uh, was elected and uh, Joe and I started talking about uh, Justin Trudeau and he said, oh, yeah, you know, I really like this guy. I said. Really? You like him? And so then I proceeded to kind of disabuse him of that uh, positive affective position. And the reason, you know, people start to say, well, you know, why are you so acerbic, professor, when you're, you know, sometimes critiquing people? Well, because people don't really realize what a dangerous buffoon he is because he exemplifies not just, say, support for CRT, but every single idea pathogen that I discuss in the parasitic mind, he is a walking manifestation of that. Now, that's not... And I'm not trying to be charitable towards him. That's not because, you know, he's a diabolical, evil guy. It's because he is a product of the educational system that he went through, right? So if that's all that he has learned, that's all that's been, you know, thrown at him, then he is going to eventually ape those positions. And regrettably for the rest of us, we're going to be uh, on the receiving end of these terrible ideas, right? Yeah, and, and you can see it. I mean, he's a perfect, he is a product in a literal sense. I mean, he's a perfect delivery mechanism for these ideas. And you see that everywhere. And it's it's so strange to me where you have a, what is now becoming kind of the official ideology of elite institutions that can package students and package political candidates, package uh, activists and executives. And they're able to do so in a way that is totally isolated from the reality that the rest of the American or Canadian people live in. Um, they, they exchange ideas that have uh, symbolic value over tangible value, but that's enough for them to kind of raise, raise, raise. And then they make the fatal mistake where they, they mistake their symbolic reality. There's kind of symbolic language that, that they use amongst themselves for the reality of the country that they represent or the institutions uh, for the people that those institutions are supposed to serve. And I think that's where we're getting this really split in reality, where there's a, a devouring, there's a, a kind of parasitic ideology that is working our way through the institutions that is now starting to be at odds and in tension with uh, the experience of most people. And, uh, and I, I'm, I'm curious how you think, like, what is the end game of that? How long can that last? Is that a stable uh, institutional balance or does it, I mean, where does this go yeah. from here? You know, I'd like to think, Christopher, that uh, there's going to be a autocorrective mechanism because otherwise there'd be no point in getting out of bed or, you know, booking a chat with you because then it's all over and let's just wait for the sweet death to arrive upon us, right? Uh, so I'd like to think that at some point the silent majority will wake up because I think you and I both agree that the great majority of people despise this nonsense. Now, I mean, not just CRT. CRT is just one manifestation of a much larger, you know, monster of irrationality. And so I think that people will eventually wake up. But the problem is that the longer you wait for that awakening to happen, the more costly it is to then cor correct the course, right? So we, 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 can, we can solve it today uh, you know, peacefully, or we could solve it in 50 years violently. I mean, I always remind my, my wife privately that, you know, a lot of people who are, you know, passive and pacifist and peaceful today are one day going to have be tired of being labeled evil because of their skin you, and they may not be so passive and peaceful and pacifist. So do we want to wait till then? So at some point there will be a correction 
So I think these ideas will be defeated. The question is how much uh, blood and guts are we willing to spend to autocorrect? So that's why I hope that through you know the actions that you're engaging in and other activists are engaging in, we can correct the you know the the reality without too much bloodshed. And I, when I say bloodshed, I'm not being hyperbolic. I truly think that this is unsustainable. I mean, people oftentimes when I say things like uh, you know we're going to have a repeat of Lebanon that I escaped from here in the in the West, people say, "Oh come on, what are you talking about?" But because they don't realize that I don't mean by next Tuesday we're going to have house to house fighting. But give it enough time, give it 50, 100, 150 years, there is no other outcome, right? Lebanon is the perfect epitome of what happens to a society that is completely organized along identity politics line, right? Lebanon is the is the exemplar, right? Do we want to recreate that here? Of course not. Yet we have one party in the United States that views it as incredibly progressive to try to repeat the Lebanese experience. That's insane to me. Yeah, it is. I, I remember I, I was in Lebanon in 2006. Oh, no and, kidding. Uh, Why is that? Yeah, and, and in Beirut, and uh, I, I loved it. It's a beautiful place. And uh, But I remember we were staying at the Intercontinental in, in downtown Beirut, and I remember looking out the window, and there was a large crater um, uh, in the street, a large crater. And I said, oh, that's, that's kind of strange. What, what's that? And they said, oh, you know, that's where they killed our last prime minister. I mean, <laughs> a car bomb. And it's then you really, seeing it, you really say, oof, I mean, this is a sophisticated society. It's an ancient society. It has, you know, I mean, and 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 you can you can just see it. You can see it in talking to people. And uh, and one of the most interesting things in my reporting this last six months, I've been talking about schools. I've talked to a lot of parents, immigrants. Uh, you know, my my dad is an immigrant, but you know, I've talked to a lot of immigrants from former communist countries uh, or current communist countries. And like in China, and uh, parents in the Bay Area say, hey, you know we remember the cultural revolution and that same feeling that I had back then kind of going up your neck when you're, when you're, when you're in this highly ideologized and very volatile environment, I'm getting that same feeling here in the United States, which I never thought I'd feel. Yeah. Even I talked to a woman in, in Portland, Oregon. I just did a story about Portland school. She grew up in Iran and she said, I remember when I was a kid before school, we would stand outside the classroom and we would chant death to America every morning. Yeah. I came to the, I, I remember crying and my father was a, a wise person and said, don't believe what they're teaching you in school. These people are evil. One day I'm going to get you out of here. She was able to immigrate to the United States, you know, set up a good life for herself. And she said, I feel like the same thing is happening to my kids in America. Yeah. And it's wow. just, and it's just shot. I, I, I don't know what to do. I don't know where to turn. I don't know where to go. This was once you got to America, that, that, that was it. You're free from this kind of, uh, a heavy ideology, heavy indoctrination in schools, and heavy hatred. And to me, though, those are the testimonies that, and, and your testimony. I mean, you know, coming from Lebanon, uh, it's it's the same story. And these are people we have to listen to. It's like these people know where this goes. Exactly. Uh, they know where it ends. And unfortunately, most Americans are saying, "Well, you know, I don't want to be called a racist at the school board meeting, so I'm going to let this one slide." How do we it's how dangerous. do we how do we unweaponize this fear? You know, it it you know, it's it's probably not hyperbolic to state that most people are more afraid to be called racist and bigoted than to be killed, right? I mean, it's, it's really the ultimate punishment in today's society, right? I mean, you know, choosing between decapitation by ISIS or having some blue-haired person on Twitter calling you racist, oh, I'll choose decapitation by ISIS any day. I mean, how is that? I mean, how can you convince people that, you know, if you have a strong sense of personhood where you, you know, you're a decent person, you know, you're not bigoted, you know, so let, you know, as, as I think Obama had famously done when he went like this, like, I don't, I don't care what people say about me, you know, that, you know, how can we get people to have that sense of strong personhood that they are not shackled by the fears of being, you know, uh, Call the racist. Yeah, I mean, you, you know, there's there's tactical, uh, there's like tactical things we could talk about, but I think more than anything, it's it's courage. That's the virtue that's required of us. And what I've seen in the last six months is is what I hope is a sea change, a, 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 a big shift. And people are afraid of that now. As the costs rise, as they feel a personal cost to this stuff, it's giving them a sense of balance. So, well, you know what? I have to take a risk and. 
I've also noticed that a lot of people who are in our orbit, who are in our circle, we've spoken out early and first, shown some leadership, and that gives courage to people who yeah. who aren't in that position. And and I think that it's you know it's really the, the every person that comes out and says I'm taking a stand, this is what I believe, call me whatever you want, I'm not backing down. It makes it easier for that next person. So I think that this is not just a, a linear mechanism. I think it's a, a kind of geometric mechanism yeah. where we are on the first side of this, but I'm already starting to see people in schools coming out, whistleblowers coming out, dissenters coming out. Um, people within institutions have to start raising the flag and saying, this is not right. So we have to do whatever we can. And, and the universities is kind of the, the big question. And, I'd be curious, have you noticed a difference on campus or among your colleagues and peers in the last year? Has there been any any of these shifts happening in the university world? Uh, for the better or the worse, or, or either. <laughs> you tell me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, f- yeah. frankly, it's been for the, for the worse. Uh, wow. I almost never get anyone to openly and publicly even come close to joining me. Now, they, they'll they all send me private messages saying, oh my God, you're my hero, but please, please don't, if you read my email, don't mention my name. As if, you know, being associated with the values that I support is something to be ashamed of. Uh, so that's why it's a bizarre world. But certainly what I see at the university level is a increase in the orgiastic uh, celebration of uh, personal identities, right? So... I mean, I can literally, Christopher, take out a screenshot of, you know, university communiques where every single story is congratulations to so-and-so, first transgender indigenous to do this. Congratulations to first uh, non-ableist, uh, g- transgender, non-gendered, non-binary person of color. So that there is no longer even an attempt to just judge people based on, oh my God, you just solved a really important theorem. Well, if the person who solved that important theorem turns to be a sufferer of two dreadful diseases, they're white and they're male, then we certainly won't celebrate that. But if they were non-gendered indigenous, we would. Now, again, people oftentimes will hear me say that and say, oh, but, you know, why are you so acerbic against, uh, I'm, I'm not... I just judge people based on the great things that they do. I ask people to judge me based on the totality of my merits and my flaws. I don't ask people to judge me based on the fact that I'm Lebanese Jew. Look, I'm the first Lebanese Jew evolutionary psychologist. I'm the first Lebanese Jew consumer psychologist. I'm the first Lebanese Jew probably to have Christopher Rufo on my show. I'm the first Lebanese Jew to be married to my wife. So these <laughs> these first per, free, these first stories are grotesque, right? They are they are foundationally a violation of the most fundamental classical liberal tenet of individual dignity. And yet somehow the message that I'm telling you, which should be as clear as the existence of gravity, is not what administrators believe in. As a matter of fact, they fully try to disassociate themselves from me. They can't seem to be able to fire me, but we can certainly pretend as though God sad is invisible. It's grotesque. It's lu- it's lunacy. Yeah, but well, I think, though, it, it might be helpful to think of why does that first X, Y, and Z story resonate? And I think it's, some, it's, it's representative of the larger problem is that they've seized language that has a surface level appeal of being something inspirational, something celebratory, something groundbreaking, something uh, good. And look, all things being equal, I think likely both you and I would agree, hey, all things being equal, having a variety of people from a variety of backgrounds is good. Um, but I think, you know, one one idea that I've been playing with a lot and, and I think has been resonating with people is is getting out of, like, this is kind of like superficial, right? It's like marketing language. Yeah. That's all it is. This is marketing language. And, and, hey, I like marketing language. It's important. We have to understand it that, you know, you know better than anyone. But but we have to say, well, what is the substance here? And then what are we really talking about? And when people, when I get caught in debates with people about diversity, well, we want X of these people. Oh, you froze. You know, you froze. You got to repeat all that you said. It's going to take some editing on my part. Okay. When, you, when you get calls from people, go ahead. 
Yeah, yeah, you know, you know when, when I get calls from people, people or when I'm when in debates and conversations with people where they're saying, we need to talk, we need to talk about, about diversity. diversity. We need we X, Y, and Z number, number of these people. people. We, need we need to celebrate, celebrate the story of this, you know, you know, uh, uh, one-armed uh, Native, Native American, American tribal elder, elder or whatever. Or whatever. Like, like, there's all these things, and you can get swept up in the internal logic of that. And then you have to take a step back and say, well, what are we really talking about? We're talking about diversity. Okay. Again, diversity, all things being equal, I think is good. I, I, I think we, we probably agree on that. But what about raising it up to a higher conceptual level and to say, well, what is the point of the university or the corporation or the K-12 school? Is diversity the end goal? Is it the telos of what we're doing? I think maybe a better one is excellence. And all of a sudden the debate changes. If you say, well, my standard is really excellence because excellence is a standard that treats everyone equally. And uh, everyone of any background, it challenges them to achieve their full potential. So it, it, it subordinates diversity to its rightful place, which is a secondary value, and then brings the, con the, the conceptual conversation up to a level that, is, uh, that I think is better and, it, and is in much friendlier terrain for people that share our beliefs. And, and I think that if you put it in those frames, say, hey, we have one, what is the highest thing? Do we want excellence or do we want diversity? Well, excellence can comprise diversity, um, but if you go for diversity without excellence, I don't think that that makes, I don't think that that really inspires people. I think that's something that really gets people's heart. And I think a lot of what our challenge is really to figure out, you know, to, to, to kind, of, kind of point out the flaws in the opposing ideologies, but also to like reframe, what are we talking about? What are we aiming for? What, what, is, our, what, are, what is our kind of primary value or, or principle or end that is superior uh, to our opponents. And uh, I think the more we can do that, the better chance that we have at actually rallying people uh, to, to support us. Yeah, see, I, see, I think that, uh, yeah, I mean, all, all that you're saying is fine. The problem comes from the, from the fact that at many points in, in your attempts to, you know, for example, to elevate excellence, uh, to be on a higher plane than, say, just the orgiastic pursuit of diversity, there are many points at which critical reasoning, you know, traps can lead people astray. And the, the, that's one of the reasons why in The Parasitic Mind, I talk about the distinction between feeling versus thinking. And I argue that it's not so, you know, th this dichotomy is false because it's not, it's not as though, you know, reason is superior and, and affective-based responses are inferior. The problem arises when you don't, we are both, we are both a thinking animal and a feeling animal. And so a lot of the, the, the affective responses that people have to say CRT when they are supporters of it, it, it's totally normal for people to have their affective system triggered. What the challenge though is to know when to trigger which system. So the example that I always give is if I'm walking down a dark alley and I see four young men loitering around, I'm trying to take a shortcut to get home, and then I get an affective response. My heart starts racing, uh, I start perspiring, my blood pressure goes up. That affective response makes perfect, perfect evolutionary sense. It, it, it is correctly being triggered at that point. If I'm trying to solve a calculus problem and I have my affective response being triggered rather than my cognitive system, um, all the affection in the uh, affective response in the world is not going to help me solve the calculus problem. So I think what happens to a lot of people is they they look at the the starting point of say CRT. Don't, don't you want to get rid of bigotry? And that's where it ends. And then people say that just feels good. But then there are a whole bunch of places where their critical reasoning ability should have been triggered, but it fails. And this is what I. There's a book that was written, I, I, I cited it in my book, by uh, Evan Syed. He, he wrote a book a few years ago on uh, progressives really being stuck at the developmental stage of kindergarten logic. And I think it's an incredibly powerful position. I, and I say this not to be demeaning to progressives, oh, they are so dumb. It's because they are very much driven by the, the, by the primacy of affective responses. Hey, there's been injustices in the past, so if we now create a new world order where we seek to eradicate that, aren't you for that, Christopher? It ends there. That's it, right? And, and I often see that when I try to engage people, but then when I force them to think what are the consequences of what you are supporting, it then takes a lot of effort to get them to the right position, which kind of leads me to the next point, which is, 
you said, I, I heard you chatting yesterday. I mean, I heard the chat yesterday, but it was earlier. You chatted with Dave Rubin and you were arguing that, you know what? It's too costly to actually have these one-on-one -on -one debates with people. I'd rather just go after the sort of the big impactful interventions. Do you think, do you still hang on to that? Or do you think that it's worthwhile to be doing, you know, trench warfare, trying to convince one mind at a, at a time? Because oftentimes we won't listen to the big message. I really have to have this conversation one-on-one -on -one with you to lead you down to reason. Do you follow what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah no, no I, I, I think I both, think right? I, I think, I think that, that there is a room, room there, there's, there's ultimately like as human beings, we change, change our minds and our hearts, and our hearts in, in in intimate, in intimate relationships, relationships, in conversation, and people that we know, and family. So, you have, you have to have that, that. but that's, that's not really scalable, scalable for uh, for true. everyone, right? You have a limited kind of number of those close bonds, and yeah, certainly you should you should, you should, you should talk, talk to people. people. But if we want to like solve this problem in the next, or make progress on this problem in the next twelve months, we have to reach a broad audience. And I think a lot of the times. Um, you know, you know, we can't, can't in, underestimate the power, power of mass, mass persuasion. persuasion. And, you know, I think, you know, I think critical, critical race theory is a perfect example. example. A year, a year ago, ago, nobody, nobody had, had heard, heard about critical race theory outside, outside of a very small group of people. people. Um, um, and, then, and then, you know, you know there was a there's number, a number of, people of people and, 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 and James Lindsay and Peter Bogosian and people in these kind of circles that were raising the alarm, but hadn't gotten it to that mass persuasion level. It was still kind of a niche issue. Then, then you know, you know I, did I did my series of reports. reports. President, President Trump, Trump picked it up. He blasted, he blasted it everywhere, everywhere. Politicized it, nationalized it, nationalized it. it. And, now and now all of a sudden, sudden you have 15, 15 state, state legislatures, legislatures trying to tackle it. it. You, you have, have uh, bills, bills in the House, in the House of Representatives. You have United States senators. You have, senators, you have governors. governors. This, is this is a national, national issue, and people are moving on it. So when I see like, when I see today, like or this week, I see these like a mom in a school district in suburban Texas. Like, like losing, losing her mind, mind at a school, at a school board, board meeting saying, saying we got to get critical race theory out. This is so bad. bad. And I think and like in a weird way, way it's like, like, whoa, like, like I'm one of the one dominoes, dominoes very early on, on that, that led, led to this, this big shift. shift. And, 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 this, and this, this woman's, woman's behavior that I've never met, I've, I've influenced it in a, in a way. And for me, that was a big lesson. Like you, you, you have to take these ideas out of the realm of pure intellect and argumentation and debating with like so and so at you know whatever magazine, and actually try to try to get it in a in a in a language and a story and a, and in a, a feeling where people can latch onto it and you can give people at all walks of life a sense of urgency, a sense of action, and a sense of what to do, a sense of how to think about it. So. I guess, I guess the, I mean, it's, it's maybe, maybe a hedge, a hedge but, I but I think it's it's, it's, think it's, really, it's really both. both. But, I but I think oftentimes, oftentimes we underestimate that power of reaching large numbers of people and, and, trying, and trying, to trying to persuade through these, these you know, you know bigger, bigger mechanisms. mechanisms. I think the reason why I, I was asking you the question is because for many people, now, you've developed the platform and the network and the, you know, strategic oversight that allows you to attack the problem at this larger scalable you know uh, unit of analysis and that's that's great and i agree that we we need it at that level because as you said it's not scalable to to fight you know every individual on facebook but on the other hand by by being able to tell people but you know what you're still making a difference if you do fight it at your most atom uh, atomized level that's also important. And, and the reason why I say this is because a lot of people will write to me, Christopher, and say, well, I'm not some fancy professor like you mm. with this huge platform. What You keep saying, activate your inner honey badger, professor. What do you expect me to do? I'm not Joe Rogan. I'm not Gatsad. I can't do what you do. And then I get back to them and I say, hey, nobody's asking you to, to have that voice. But you can go to your local school meeting. You can speak to your friends on Facebook, part of it. And so by, by, by at least empowering people that within the small sphere of influence of their daily lives, they could still affect change, then it makes them feel they could be part of the solution. Because if otherwise you say, this is not scalable, it's only guys with the, who have the ear of President Trump, Christopher Rufo, who is going to make a difference, then I could sit back and now I have a justification for why I'm not getting involved. Does, does that make sense? Yeah, no, that makes sense. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. Maybe I maybe I misspoke or wasn't clear. No, I, I agree with you. And 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 I think actually what you're saying is another uh, 
another important split or another important complementary scale things where you have the scale of like the legislature or the courts. Like I'm running lawsuits right now. I hope to get good court ruling so that 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 a lot of this stuff is actually you know deemed illegal. I'm hoping to get great legislative uh, achieve uh, uh, legislative accomplishments so we can say, hey, we're we're limiting the scope of what public institutions can teach and indoctrinate. But to but your, to your point, point, those, those things, things are formal legal, legal mechanisms, mechanisms that, will that will be meaningless unless it's at fo- enforced in the realms, realms of culture and local institutions. institutions. So, so it is, is if you, and, and, and honestly, very, very truly, if you had to have, have one or the one other, other, I'd take I'd those, those cultural norms, norms because, because those yeah. things are much more powerful than legislators who've written on a page if nobody believes it. So I think they're complementary. And I think like for me personally, like I, you know, you know, it's, it's like, yeah, you're yeah, given a you're gift, gift, you're given a, a responsibility, responsibility, you're given an opportunity, and it's like, I'm going to go all out. And what I think I can do more than anything is like inspire people to, to just like to show them you can you can do it, whatever level you can, whatever capacity you have, like push back and 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 hear some kind of things that you can do. Hear some language and. I, I think more than anything, people are scared. You said it yourself. You said people are more scared to be racist than getting blown up by ISIS. More scared to be called racist. And I th- you know, that's like barely an exaggeration. It's like yeah. kind of strange at how small of that uh, of an exaggeration that is. And and, and I, I you know, and, and on the other hand too, like don't you think we have to also level with people to say, hey, look, if you're going to tangle, you have to be ready for these consequences. consequences. Like it will it happen, happen to you. And, uh, and uh, not, not say, oh, you can get there and everything's gonna be great. It's, it's like, like, hey, this is the world we live in. This is contentious, contentious stuff. stuff. How, how, how do you, how do you advise, advise people? people? I'd be curious when you're yeah. thinking, hey, what should I do? What, what's your kind of main takeaway? Yeah, so usually it's the following. Uh, and it's it might at first sound as though I'm being a bit too trenchant, but I think sometimes that's how you have to wake people up. So someone will write to me and say, but you know, I'm afraid to be unfriended. I'm afraid to lose family members. I'm afraid to lose my job. So they'll list a whole bunch of, you know, reasonable concerns. And then I say, and let me ask you this. Do you think that the young men, and they were men, not people, the young men who landed on Normandy, do you think they were afraid? Do you think that they were guaranteed safe passage as the uh, German uh, machine guns were going to mow them down like little mosquitoes so that you and I can sit in a quasi-free society today? And so, yes, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a grand comparison, but it basically is making the point that no war, whether it be an ideological war or an actual physical war, can guarantee you safe passage. Now, each person has to modulate their risk. Nobody is saying, please be a reckless martyr, right? I mean, Aristotle talked about, and I briefly mentioned this in The Parasitic Mind, I mean, if you're too reckless of a soldier, then it's, it serves no purpose. And if you're too cowardly, then it serves no purpose. There is somewhere the golden mean where you, you exhibit the, the virtue of courage without being intemperate, either in your cowardice or in your recklessness. So nobody is saying that you have to take unnecessary risk, but you can't simply say, my job is too important to take any risk. Uh, I'm too busy in my life preparing for my daughter's looming wedding you know, let Christopher Rufo worry about that. He, he, I think he's got a hand on this. So once you diffuse the responsibility onto others, I mean, you know, when, when, for example, you teach MBA students about the optimal portfolio investment strategy is a diversified strategy, right? So diversification of risk is something that's how we're going to win this. You don't put it on the shoulder of five, six courageous people who put their neck on the line for the rest of us. And uh, frankly, I think that that usually will trigger people into action because I've received, and I'm curious, after I finish this long-winded re- reply, I, I want I want to know your experience in terms of how often have you been able to get people who had been apathetic to then say, you know what, you've energized me and I'm going to that meeting. I receive hundreds of these, if not thousands. Have you received a lot of that stuff? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, 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 I do. I do. And, and um, yeah, yeah, I mean, thousands and thousands and thousands, and thousands of these messages. messages. And, and it's, it's really neat. neat. Like, like, those, those are, are some of the most meaningful, meaningful you, know, you know, units, units of, of feedback, feedback that I get because... 
you know, it's you like, know, it's like people who are also inspired to be whistleblowers. whistleblowers. I've done a lot of whistleblower reporting that has really moved the national conversation at that high and a mass media level. But it all stems because one person and one institution took the risk of leaking me documents. And, and you know, I always tell them, I say, hey, look, I will keep your information confidential. But, but there is, there a, is risk. a risk. There is a there risk, is a risk that, that someone will will, will think, think that it was you. There is a risk to your. To, I mean, there is some level of risk, and and some people say, all right, I'm not really willing to take that. But a lot of people are saying, you know what? Two years ago, I wouldn't have done this, but it's it's so important. I'm going to do it today. And I want you know, I I don't want to tell my tell the story publicly, but I want you to tell it on my behalf. And and people, you know. Get messages, get messages to say, hey, I, I, now I now have, have the courage, courage to, speak. to speak. I went, I went to my company, company and I asked them a lot of questions about their, their you know, equity, equity program. program. And, and I think, I think we're going to, you know, be able, know, be able to get, get some, some changes. changes. And, and that's, that's it. it. I, mean, I mean, that's, that's like, like, that's at the level of life, life right? Like, like we, we, we operate in this weird abstract world, right? It's the level of symbols and ideas and um, um, and, and but 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 ultimately, but ultimately like we want to influence and we want, and we want to see good things, good things happening at the level of real life, real life. Um, and, and, and and that's, that's like, like for me the validation, validation of, 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 of 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 all the things that, things that I do it's is saying, saying wow, wow people, people in their real lives are like are inspired, inspired. They're, they're, they're they're pushing, pushing back they, they find meaning in this and you know I hope it helps you know I'm I'm glad you said meaning because that that was going to be my next follow up question so in my next book. Uh, which I'm currently working on, uh, I offer some a recipe, not not a guaranteed recipe, but a recipe for how to achieve you know happiness and contentment and enrichment in your life, right? And of course, many, many people have written about this. Here I share my own personal view on this topic along with some scientific evidence. And of course, at the center of any such discussion is you know having purpose and meaning in life. And so I guess my next question to you is, you know, you you had not set out to you know to be the CRT or the anti CRT guru, but I would suspect, based on your previous answer of you know receiving all this validation from people and that you're encouraging them and inspiring them, uh, I mean, you must be on a on a high cloud of purpose and meaning uh, currently, no? Yeah, yeah I, 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 I am, and yeah, I, I think it's like, like um, it's, it's the call, the call right? right? There's, There's the call, the call to, adventure, to adventure and. and um, um, I, took I took it, it. and it's and like, it's like okay, okay, there's this, there's this, this, this and, and it's like, I'm like the, I'm like the strangest, strangest spokesman for this, I, I would be in position, position. And, then, and then, and then all of a sudden, sudden that, that, that call to adventure, that opportunity, opportunity then turns into a responsibility. responsibility. You realize, you realize that, that, oh my gosh, gosh I'm, speaking I'm speaking on behalf of, of, of a lot of people and people really need this and you're providing a service to so many folks. And and yeah, yeah, I mean, it, it, it is. It's, it's like a like lot, lot of, of it's, a, it's, it's, it's overwhelming sometimes. sometimes and it, it is um, frightening, frightening sometimes. sometimes. I'm sure, I, I, imagine I imagine you have gone, gone through, through the same where, where you know, you're, you're, you're kind of like, all right, right I'm, I'm doing, doing this thing. thing. I'm, I'm out there swashbuckling. swashbuckling. I could get I blown up at any minute. I mean, you know, there's, you know, you get the angry emails from the New York Times demanding answers to all these questions. And you, you kind of, like, like just, just float, float through, through it and you, and you, and you go, go into, into, in a way, like almost like I find myself going into almost like an autopilot, autopilot where, where you have, you to, have trust to trust your instincts, your instincts you, have you have to trust your intuition, your intuition and then you, and have, you have to like let all of those people buoy you, you into, into this. this. And, and, you know, you know I, 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 think I think more than anything, it's like I have also made amazing friendships through this. And when you go through the trenches with people, when you go through these difficult experiences and very, very strenuous, strenuous experiences, experiences in some ways, in some ways. The, relationships the relationships you make are forged in this unique bond, bond where it's where like it's you like have it among a, 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 only a people, people and uh, it, on it's, it's been, been great. great. It's been so, it's been so exciting. exciting. I, 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 wake I wake up every morning excited. excited. I, wake I wake up every morning feeling energized and feeling driven and feeling having some purpose and um and it, yeah, yeah, it helps yeah, you get through, through. and I, 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 I wouldn't trade it. Trade and yeah, you know, I hope in two years from now I'm doing something, something different. different. I don't want to be working on critical race, race theory forever. forever. Um, but, but you know, while, while I'm still, you know, useful, useful for people, while I'm still serving, serving a, a purpose. purpose uh, I'm going to do that, and then hopefully build out some relate structures and partnerships to eventually, you know, pass the torch to others. So we'll go for about another ten minutes. Is that okay? That's great. So, so here's the so. You said, oh, I, in two years, I don't want to be doing critical race theory. Okay, fine. I, I completely understand that. But would, are you going to be driven to do something else that could be encapsulated 
In other words, the next thing you're doing, here is how it is related to what you did in your journey of critical race theory. Can you think of how the next project will be linked to the current one? Yeah, yeah you know, you know in, in general terms, terms yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I think, I think like I want to have a through have line to the work, to the work that, that I'm doing. doing. Um, I want to have a sense that, that they're, they're adding, adding up to up something, something that, that is a body of work, of work uh, that, that is bigger, bigger than, than any one of its of parts. parts. Um, so yeah, so yeah I, I'm, 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 I'm looking, I'm actively I'm looking, looking and, uh, 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 you know, working, working on projects. And, and I think one, I think one of the things that's exciting, exciting about this is, this is I have, I'm like this, this, this like, co- like, like entry, entry point, like this collection, collection point for information. information. Mm-hmm. I, get I get so much so information, information that is sent my way and a lot of it is unique. So I'm sure that like, as I go fishing, you know, for this information, something will, 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 will pull my interest, something will spark. Um, um, and, and, uh, and then, and then I'll, 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 I'll pursue, pursue it. it. And, I, and, I and I think that, that given that the, my passion and my interests and my kind of my own relationships, relationships even, even, I know, I know that, that it will be linked, linked and, I and I hope that, that it is, is um, yeah, yeah it, 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 continues. it continues, it continues and expands and opens up new fronts, new territories, uh, for people to, to, to work in. The reason I asked you the question is because I went through an introspective exercise of answering that question for myself in chapter one of the parasitic mind, because I wanted for people to get a sense of, you know, why I was writing this book on, from a personal level. Well, I could say, having gone through the Lebanese civil war, I understand the dangers of identity politics. So I'm well in place place to talk about that, right? As an academic who's been in academia for nearly three decades, I could talk about how I have witnessed firsthand the proliferation of these idea pathogens. But there was another more personal angle that I want to take, which is how do all of these idea pathogens relate to something in me that causes me to be uniquely injured by all this bullshit, right? And, and my answer was that the two fundamental ideals that shape my life are the pursuit of truth and the defense of freedom, right? So I am someone who is very, very dogged about, uh, you know, intellectual dishonesty, dogged in, in fighting against it. And, and and I can't explain why it is. It's the unique combination of my genes. When I see someone espousing nonsense, uh, you know, Islam has never said anything negative about the Jews. <laughs> What the what the f man? I mean, I could point you to seventy three thousand places. I mean, how could you have the gall to saying to say that? Right? That offends me. Right? It offends me in the same way that, as I often have analogized, when I if you know, there are two types of people: those who hear a woman being attacked in an alley and pretend they didn't hear her cries and whisk away, and those who say wait a minute, I've got to intervene here. Well, when I see truth being murdered, when I see freedom being trampled, I'm the guy who doesn't walk away. And so in a sense, each of these idea pathogens become you know, uniquely important for me to fight against because they attack the fundamental drivers of my life, which is defend truth, defend freedom. And so my feeling is, in your case, not knowing you very well until our conversation today, is that you probably will get a downer if the next project you don't work on doesn't offer you the same sort of purpose and meaning as fighting against something as consequential as CRT. I mean, that's my prediction, but I guess we'll wait and see. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that's, yeah that's right. right. I don't know. That's, that's uh, uh, it's, it's hard. hard. I, I think too, maybe, you know, it's a, it's, it's kind of a life cycle, cycle question where, uh, uh, you know, I still, I still feel like, like I'm very new to a lot of this stuff. stuff. So, I'm so I'm still trying to put together the pieces. It's hard for me to retrospectively try to, think of think how it how all it connects, connects. And, uh, and uh i don't know i, I guess i, I just have the the the, the faith, faith and the and the, and the trust in my own uh selection, selection and intuition, intuition that, that that it will, it will. but yeah, yeah it, 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 it'd, it'd be hard to kind of go in an environment, environment of less intensity, less intensity. Exactly. and uh, you know yeah, I, I think it'd be hard, hard you know i i, I think I it's like you know it's like musicians right you see these musicians you're playing a stadium you know and then it'd be hard to go back and play that dive bar in peoria you know so but that's what happens by the way to to physical warriors right Pe- soldiers who are returning from battle you often yeah. find that what when they now return to their families they don't know where to place themselves because they've had this incredibly intense relationship with their literal literally brother in arms yeah. that they 
they find everything bland. Everything doesn't taste as good. Nothing, even that newborn child that you should be loving so much doesn't mean as much to you as the four guys on who on whom you de- depended for for you to survive another five minutes. So I think in the arena, and I don't I don't mean to imply that you know we are in Kandahar fighting uh, against yeah, yeah. Uh, ta- the Taliban. Although based on some of the death threats that I receive, or being in the ecosystem of academia, maybe I am the ultimate hero. Uh, but but it, but but truthfully, to me, I, I loved when you said I wake up every day with a sense of adventure and. Because that's exactly how I wake up. Even though I live a very stressed life, it's, boy, it's an exciting life, right? Today yeah. I'm going to talk to Christopher Rufo. Then I'm going to work on my book. Then I've got, I'm always rubbing my hands in, yeah. in excited anticipation. And so, and I, I pick that up in you. I see it. I heard you speak a few times. Is there a way that we can bottle that kind of sense of excitement to people? Or is this something that you either have or don't have? I think you have it or you don't have it to a certain extent. I think it's just a character, kind of a, 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 a born character trait. But, but even if we accept that many people don't have it, it they can also, but they can be inspired by it. Um, and then we can serve as the kind of representative for large groups of people. And, uh, you know, I, I think it's funny. I, I wonder if you feel the same way. Like I even, you know, we're in like this intellectual battlefield, right? And you know, we're in the office and I'm talking to you, I'm talking to the news, I'm writing, I'm doing social media. And it's like, I feel very much in this world. And then even with like lately, you know, like with my wife, she'd be like, what are you doing in there? You're in your office, you're like all leading this exciting life. And then you come out here and it's actually hard. There's some difficulties. It's not easy because it's like, oh, you wouldn't believe. And I, you know, I'm telling you about this and that. And then and you realize you're like, I, I, it's this, it's this really kind of beautiful thing that we have, this opportunity to, to be in this world of the mind, world of the yes. intellect, world of politics, world of ideas, world where ideas truly do move people. I mean, exactly. ideas change the world, and we are the kind of merchants of ideas. Um, Beautifully said. And, and, and trying to sell better ideas and pointing out the flaws in our, in our, the inferior ideas of our competitors and. I mean, I mean, that's what, that's it, is. what it is, and it's like, like I, I, maybe I, it is, and maybe this is maybe this is stereotypical, but like I'm a Mediterranean, right? I'm an Italian, uh, and, you're uh, and you're a Mediterranean. I, I, think I think there's something about us as Mediterraneans. Mediterranean. <laughs> like you remind me of my of my father a little bit, and it's like <laughs> something about. But a better looking version, better looking version. Better looking version. Don't tell him, but you know something about it's like we just have this thing, and 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 the ideas that have been bopping around the Mediterranean for three thousand years now. Are still, are still our vocabulary, our vocabulary. Yeah. And, and there's something, something that's, that's and, and, and the, the, the technology, technology changes. changes. We're, talking We're talking across, across countries, countries on on a, on a video, video screen, screen. But, but but it's, it's the, the same, same sense of what what, what it might have been. been like. I could see you. Uh, hanging out in the marketplace, the marketplace you, know, you know, with Socrates. Socrates. Exactly. And, 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 and you know what I mean? It's yeah, yeah. the same yeah. thing. It's the same thing. Now it's more kind of hardened and careerist and and technocratic. But there's problems. But in essence, in essence, it's the, it's the same, same feeling. feeling. It's the same, same thing. thing. And I think I, I really love that. I've always loved that. Well, I, I love that you use the example of Socrates because, you know, he would go to the to the market and interact with, you know, the great unwashed. And oftentimes people say to me, why do you waste your time replying to some Twitter person with two followers? And to me, that that's insulting because yeah, yeah. that implies that I should modulate and strategize who is worthy of a reply for me or not, depending on the number of followers I have. And I've li- literally thought of Socrates in, in the yeah. social media context. I interact with whomever. I don't, and that's why I, I, I refer to myself as the professor of the people, because I despise that elitism whereby we should only speak to the few anointed people who are at our level. I, and, and I hate to say it, but 99% of professors, I live amongst them, are exactly like that, right? You should be yeah. so lucky as to receive a reply from me. You know, the, so I, I'm totally with you. By the way, speaking of passion in the Middle East, just to, uh, or the Mediterranean, quick story. When I was a kid and someone would call me, a friend would call me at home where, you know, when I live with my parents, it's happened at least four, five, six, seven times where someone says, oh, what's going on? There's like massive fighting at your house. I go, there's no fighting. People are just talking, like it, <laughs> like, like, but it's always what's going on with all the screaming. Who's fighting? And it's literally there was absolutely zero fighting. That's just we're animated. We're we're on top of each other. We're and that passion I think we both share. And if there were a way to bottle it and sell it, 
We certainly would. Any <laughs> la- any any projects that you want to promote, discuss uh, before we wrap it up today, uh, Chris? Yeah, I mean, I'm in this rapid fire mode. So if people want to check out what I'm doing, you can go to my website, ChristopherRufo.com. Um, that's where I post all of my latest articles and videos and and projects. And uh, yeah, just get get in the mix. I mean, it, it is it's it's really exciting. I, I feel like we're in the midst of a tremendous potential change. So the more that folks like 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 you and like you know like you and me, but also the more that folks that are just getting Getting into into these set of issues, issues, just just trying to learn, learn, just watching watching podcasts, podcasts, watching watching videos, videos. um, Um, join join the conversation. conversation. I mean, that's all it, it, ultimately ultimately that's what it is. is. This is a conversation conversation that we're having as a society society, and it has to happen in this nesting nesting doll doll fashion fashion, so that that all of us are 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 communicating and sharing information. And I just have the hope ultimately, like my faith and, and I hope that it's not naive is that ultimately we have a system and a structure uh, and, uh, and, and, and a constitution, constitution uh, uh, that, that will, will enable and, and sort out and sieve out some of these truly awful, awful ideas. ideas. It, gives it gives us the power, power and the mechanism to get, to get rid of these awful ideas. ideas. Uh, so, so it's up it's to us to use them. We've been given these great uh, ideas, uh, great structures, great institutions, uh, and it's up to us to preserve them. Wonderful way to end. Thank you so much, Christopher. Stay on the line so we could say goodbye offline. It was a real pleasure talking to you and keep doing this great work. Thank you, sir.